It must be very close to three o'clock. So I would like to welcome everybody to our eighth webinar, mini webinar for, um, for 2021. Thank you for joining us. Um, we will, as always, try to keep this relatively short. Um, and as always, if anybody has any questions, um, you are invited to do so via the chat and we will try to answer those questions either as they appear or in a question and answer session after the end. So welcome everybody. Kevin, roll action, please. Welcome to season three. Okay, we have a good audience this time. Um, welcome everybody. Welcome to Fighting Tech's eighth webinar of 2021. Um, this will be our penultimate webinar at this point in time um, for this year. The topic, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, I will also be introducing um, Christoph Middelstedt, who is our guest or major presenter. Um, today, but first of all, I will quickly do the usual intro items um, and then we'll move on to the topic of today. But first of all, Christoph, how'd you do? How are you doing? Thanks for joining us today. Doing great. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. Okay, um, very quickly, what are the goals of the Fight and Tech webinars? Primarily, we want to re engage with our audiences that we have not been able to meet um at real events around the globe because they have been cancelled or postponed or shifted um, so this is one of those channels that we are utilizing to get in contact with people and provide updates about what is happening within fight and tech how we are still innovating how we are still collaborating we try to keep these webinars short which means they are for everybody involved somewhat guilt-free and that means we all have the opportunity to get back to work relatively quickly afterwards. It is also, because they are short, it's also an agile format, which means that we can improve our game if we have the opportunity and if we get feedback and if we see there is a need to change the format. What you will see in here, some briefly, some news and developments about what is going on at Biden Tech. Um, you will hear the topic for today. and We will come to that in a moment. And a major part of this fight and tech, or of any, any webinar actually, is that we have questions and answers that we try to address as the webinar proceeds or at the very latest at the end, or very latest still after the webinar, we'll get back to people's questions that have not been answered. This is probably the biggest audience we've had for a while, actually. I'm very happy to see this many people joining. Obviously an interesting topic. Still more people coming in. This is very good. Okay. News, um, we are hiring. We repeat this more or less every webinar actually over the last uh, last quarter or two quarters. Um, we are looking for people in sales, operations, marketing, service applications across the board, all departments. Um, some people have recently joined R&D. There's a post on LinkedIn. If you want to find out more about what is available, um, you can look on our careers page. Here is the link. You can also look on Epic's jobs page. Photonics jobs page, and you can also look on Stepstone. You may find other jobs posters around the internet. Um, if you do a Google search, I'm sure, I'm sure you can find those easily. We also welcome, the Germans call it eine Initiativbewerbung. So if you think your skills and interests and qualifications match what we do, send us your CV, we'll take a look, and um, maybe there's benefits to both sides that come out of that. Events in 2022, there's nothing still happening in the rest of 2021, but we will be at Photonics West in San Francisco in January, the end of January, and we will be at OFC at the beginning of March. Um, if we have anybody out of the US who is tuned in, or if we have anybody from Europe who will be going to the US and attending those events, please drop by the booth and come and find out what is new. Okay, next. So, as I said, this is the eighth webinar in 2021. Let me just check there's nobody else that wants to come in. Nope. Um, Kevin, can you quickly 
drop out of the feed so that we can see Christoph. Our primary speaker today is um, Christoph Mittelstedt, or I, maybe I'm breaking up. Um, Christoph is part of R&D, an important member of our R&D team. Christoph, thanks for joining us today. Maybe you can give us a little bit of information about what is your role within R&D? What are your goals? What are your targets? What are you up to? Just a little bit. Thank you very much, first of all. Um, yeah, I'm a team leader here at the uh, Ficantex R&D site, uh, the Aachen site. And more importantly, I'm an engineer, which is why I have the honor to hold this webinar today and tell a little bit about uh, IR processing that I was uh, summarizing. Okay, good, thank you. Um, at this point, it's probably best, and um, we are going to run the usual format where um, I will do my best to interrupt Christoph with questions and maybe with questions that come into the chat um, from, uh, from members of the audience. Um, this is Christoph's topic, not mine, so I will hand over the baton to him. Um, he will guide us through his presentation today. Christoph, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Greg. Um, yeah, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, glad that you joined uh, the webinar series today. Uh, I'm having the honors of being the speaker today. So uh, without further ado, time is limited. Kevin, next slide, please. Um, first, uh, what I want to talk about is the uh, general setup that we have here uh, at the Ficontech site for uh, laser soldering and uh, later on also for combination with the IR imaging. Typically, when we are talking about laser soldering here uh, at the Ficontech site, uh, we will have a laser source somehow attached or inside uh, the working room of our machine. And uh, we will have the laser optics forming the beam uh, that is coming from underneath. Um, so typically, we uh, deliver the beam from underneath uh, through uh, some chuck, as you will know. Uh, in this case, typically a sapphire window, which provides us to um, pretty much uh, shine uh, all of the um, for processing needed radiation uh, through there onto the part, which is typically uh, a silicon photonics chip or a wafer. And uh, in this case, we held uh, the part that we wanted to attach it, uh, that we want to attach the semiconductor with a pickup tool. This could be either uh, a gripper tool or a vacuum pickup tool. Um, on the next slide, you will see an, uh, an enlarged uh, look at the uh, processing area, if you will. Uh, so we have the chuck, we have the um, laser optics from underneath, and we have the, a liner, typically six axis or four axis liner from the top. So uh, we could do pretty much uh, a course alignment uh, aided by a top view camera and um, yeah, be pretty precise uh, with it. On the next slide, uh, I, will, I will talk about the difference uh, between the two beam sources that we actually have available um, in one of our R&D setups here. Typically, um, when you will run into uh, laser processing, soldering, welding, whatever, uh, you will have to deal with uh, a processing wavelength of around one micron. In this case, specifically, I took it down uh, 975 nanometer. Um, here we have a little bit, um, or the, the conventional way of um, performing the soldering uh, here on the uh, on the micro uh, scale or parts that are very very small is uh, you will impinge on the bottom side of the silicon photonics chip and heat conduction will do the rest. Yeah, uh, so um, the radiation will get transformed into uh, thermal energy. The thermal energy will then uh, melt the bond paths and uh, thereby the connection to the semiconductor is attained. Uh, we also have the opportunity to shine through uh, the silicon submount. That is by deploying or deploying a 1475 nanometer central wavelength beam source. By that means, we are able to uh, pretty much penetrate right through the silicon and then pinch right on top uh, of where we want to achieve the bond. Um, so uh, there are um, distinct advantages and disadvantages uh, for both techniques. As you can imagine, for the heat conduction soldering regime, as I, to, uh, as I put it here, um, this is a standard beam source, uh, laser processing. Is, there's also the feasibility of uh, processing multiple bond, uh, bond paths in one go. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, we have limited process efficiency. As you can imagine, we impinge on the, uh, on the bottom side, have to rely on uh, yeah, the, the thermal conducting or heat conducting effect. And uh, also eventual, the thermal impact on the surroundings of our bomb pads has to be considered. Uh, on the other hand, 
um, we have the 1475 nanometer beam source where we can impinge uh, right there where we want to have the energy uh, that is the bond pad being melted. There we have obviously the least uh, uh, yeah, thermal impact on surrounding components as you could imagine, but uh, also you have, to, um, you have to have a look at uh, the components that you need for beam shaping. These are non-standard. Uh, this is uh, not well established to say the least uh, in, in manufacturing. And also uh, there's the potential of yeah, damaging the, uh, the die that you, or the semiconductor that you want to attach to your uh, silicon photonics chip. Why is that? Because typically those uh, semiconductors are emitting uh, wavelength in the range of 40, 70, 50, 50, whatever. Uh, that means also they are sensitive when it comes to this radiation. So therefore, um, both uh, the uh, constructing of uh, the silicon photonics chip along with the semiconductor, they have to be uh, tailored. They have to be set up to one another so that we can impinge with our 1475 laser beam right on the bomb pad and nothing but the bomb pad to avoid damage. Christoph? Yes. Um, we have a question already from um, Jörg Smolensky. The question is, um, what is the typical time required for soldering with each method? Excellent question. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, as you could imagine, there are uh, yeah, there, there's a significant difference uh, in the time being needed for uh, the individual approaches here. In the 975 or one micron range, we are typically around a second. Uh, that could be uh, as low as uh, 300 milliseconds or something, or even up to a few seconds. When it comes to 1475, so through silicon soldering, uh, the processing time is reduced significantly to uh, some milliseconds in the range of uh, less than 10 milliseconds. I've, um, I've done even less than one millisecond soldering times there. I mean, we see a significant difference here, right? One is obviously thermal diffusion is the process. Um, and the, uh, with the 1475, you're just directly hitting the solder material, so. Exactly. Okay, please continue. Okay, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, one thing that I want to uh, drag your attention to is how uh, bomb pads are set up here. There are, um, at least to my understanding, or to my understanding, there are multiple ways of setting things up, though, but the most uh, common ones I took down here. Uh, you see on the left-hand sketch, uh, a multi-layer uh, gold tin eutectic system. So multiple layers are stacked up in the way uh, that a contribution or a composition of 80, 20 weight percentage that is of gold and tin are set up. Um, this is obviously, a, or this might be a little easier uh, setting things up, uh, setting the bomb pad up. And on the right side in the sketch, uh, you see a gold tin eutectic pre-mixed solder that is typically gold capped to provide uh, oxidation before uh, processing. And what you will also always find is uh, some, um, um, some layers that help uh, connecting to these bomb pads and you will always have uh, gold on a semiconductor side. Um, here, uh, the phase diagram on the right-hand side of the slide comes into place. So, uh, or because the one thing that we have to consider when processing these parts is uh, that the temperature required to uh, attain a proper reflowing and bonding is, and that this will be slightly, if not uh, to some significance, above the eutectic temperature of around uh, 280 degrees Celsius. Um, that said, my, rec uh, my recommendation here, uh, if you want to go as low as possible with the thermal impact on your uh, surroundings, is you go with pre-mixed gold-capped solder. And um, yeah, the, the one thing additionally uh, to be said here is that this is of uh, particular interest when it comes to the through silicon soldering with the 1475 uh, nanometer wavelength. And um, you, you could imagine, having longer laser on times uh, or pulse times uh, would be uh, around one micron wavelength. Um, it is not that um, uh, sensitive towards uh, this layer composition, uh, composition and uh, also this temperature regime. We have more energy available to achieve a proper reflowing, component mixturing, and uh, eventually the bonding. Um, this is of more significance when it comes to the 4075, setting things up properly here. Here I brought some uh, example of how processing with uh, 1475 nanometer can look like. 
basically the bottom line that I want to make here is that uh, processing is very reliable. Uh, although you, you might uh, it might look a little different on the left hand uh, or left top hand side sketch. Um, this is also uh, to be uh, to be related to some inconsistent metallization, um, what we were aware of. Um, but nonetheless, this is very, very reliable. If you click one further, Kevin, um, you see some, some bullet points that I took down of uh, what's the objective now. Um, that is, um, now, if we uh, are able to use this wavelength for through silicon processing, uh, could we use it for something else or this regime for something else? For, for this talk, obviously, the IR imaging. And um, yeah, one thing to, to keep in mind here is the optical resolution uh, available for this uh, specific wavelength. Nonetheless, uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is exactly this topic, this IR imaging. Next slide. Now, this could be a game changer when it comes to um, yeah, silicon photonics um, assembly, because usually, as you will all uh, be aware of, uh, we have to put a, a semiconductor on, on top of our um, silicon photonics chip, and we will have to use at least four components. Um, that is one uh, lens array, uh, one uh, optical isolator, prism, et cetera, et cetera. But it would be of uh, significant interest, uh, interest, one slide, uh, or next slide, please. It would be game-changing if we could uh, set the 3.5 die directly in front of the waveguide. We could get rid of all of these uh, processing steps uh, that we have to do today. Um, so um, our idea is uh, to identify reference marks that are usually shielded, if you click one more. Perfect, thanks. <laughs> when you're sinking the 3.5 uh, die into the cavity uh, in front of the waveguide, um, the reference mark is obviously shielded uh, when uh, looking at it uh, from the top side. So uh, again, here we come with our solution. Next slide. Uh, that is the IR imaging and the through silicon machining vision. Uh, again, we are taking advantage of uh, silicon's uh, increasing transmittance. This is not 100%. This is um, in the range of 50%, as you will find um, for uncoated uh, beer silicon crystal. But you could also, um, yeah, make this increase a little bit uh, with, uh, uh, with layer technology. That said, um, the, the one thing that we do here is we make use of avail already available on the market, uh, high dynamic range um, Ingus type cameras. Um, as you see by the um, graph underneath, um, that uh, the typical silicon uh, technology, the, the sensitivity that is, is limited when it comes to the near infrared uh, spectrum. But uh, if we focus on the Ingus uh, camera chip technology, we are getting a really good uh, sensitivity and efficiency when monitoring this kind of radiation. So uh, therefore, we're making use of this Ingus technology that is now available with uh, down to, uh, I should say, five micron uh, pixel slicer. Christoph, now, if I may. Yes. I think um, um, maybe I was reading the, note, the chat and, and not paying attention, but I think an important point here is it's, um, this is what we do here is we integrate the uh, the 1475 machine vision into the machine vision of the system. So it becomes an integral part of the referencing, component referencing, component recognition, and positioning vision system of the of the of the machine as a whole. That's right. Um, it's not necessarily uh, 1475 that we're using for the imaging here. Uh, we are free uh, to use wavelength in that spectrum uh, from, say, uh, 1,100 um, nanometers up to 1.3 micron, 1.4 micron. That's all available for us. But yes, uh, we do have these uh, vision systems inside of our machines right now. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, one example uh, that I was able to bring with me here from one of our funded projects uh, that is Master, you can check that out uh, at master.eu, is a uh, polished uh, silicon photonics uh, chip. And here the great news, uh, as you can see, is what we are able to see with our top view and the visible spectrum, we are pretty much also able to see through uh, the die, through the chip, with our IR uh, vision from underneath. And this is a game changer, and I will tell you why that is. The next slide, um, you will see that we can now, uh, or we are now in a state that we can track down such things as fiducials uh, from underneath that are 
uh, normally um, or that would be uh, shielded when we're doing the alignment with the uh, three five uh, semiconductor from the top. Um, here's just an example of uh, this fiducial tracking accuracy that we are able to achieve. Not the best, uh, but uh, some, something that I can show you. Um, you will see on the, uh, the uh, y-axis the offset value in micron, that is the offset to the determined mean position value that I found here over a range of uh, approximately seven minutes. And uh, what this slide shall tell you is uh, that we can track down fiducius with the IR vision pretty accurate. Uh, here, single sigma of uh, 140 nanometers up to three sigma for 20 nanometers. Um, so that we, uh, that we said to ourselves, this is quite interesting. Uh, we want to have a, a further look at this. Now, uh, the, one point, uh, the one point that I will make, um, the parts have to, um, have to give us the opportunity to do proper uh, IR uh, imaging. That said, one very important feature of the parts, next slide, please, Kevin, is the surface roughness. And this has to be as low as possible. Um, what does that mean, as low as possible? Well, what I can tell you is that uh, I quantified it for uh, this given example. The, the mean roughness was in the range of uh, a single nanometer um, surface roughness. Well, um, what we also had a look at, or uh, what I wanted to have a look at it, is um, how does this imaging look like for the rough uh, surface, uh, bottom side surface, that is, of course. And uh, we'll see on the next slide, Kevin. Um, that in a range of the uh, wavelength that we're using for this IR inspection, which is in the range of one micron, um, the vision is uh, pretty much impossible. The image is super blurry and you are not able to do IR vision whatsoever at all. So the parts have to be polished from the uh, backside to allow proper IR imaging. How much of an additional step is that in part processing? Is that, is that something that's realistically can be asked? Oh, oh yes, um, this is very uh, realistic to be asked. Um, of course, I, I cannot tell you how much of an effort this is for the customer to uh, yeah, polish uh, on, a, on a wafer level or on a dial level, uh, the FMF. Um, but what I will say is that it's definitely possible uh, if you ask for it, that you could get uh, polished wafers or chips. And, and that the higher the grade of polish and the better the resolution is likely to be is what I interpret here. That's right, I've seen so far, uh, although I will also say that I've been not able to uh, quantify it as a whole uh, with something, say, like uh, the, the contrast level over the surface roughness. Uh, the one thing that I will say is having a polished wafer is mandatory to do proper IR vision. This, this is, this is um, interesting from, a, from another aspect in that, once again, we are, um, we are looking at an aspect which is which basically falls into the category of design for manufacturing, right? Um, whether it's regards to the components, component shapes, um, I think you're going to talk about the judicial shapes that you prefer to see on these components, but it also refers to then with, with this slide or with the last two slides that you've been talking about, um, to what extent that the quality of the wafer or the polishing quality on the wafer is going to play a role in, in being able to, uh, to apply this, this, uh, this, uh, this process. Okay. Exactly. So uh, the next logical step that we took here, thank you, Kevin, is uh, IR vision testing of the dyes through the silicon wafer. You see here uh, one, one image that just highlights uh, uh, a semiconductor being picked up and the silicon uh, submarine underneath uh, being clamped on our uh, sapphire chuck. And uh, what I did then, next slide, is uh, I tried to track. Uh, first of all, I tried to see and then track uh, the position of the fiducial of the dye through the silicon. And what you will see here is that we are able to do as good as 70 to uh, 60 nanometers single sigma, uh, which is in the range of the accuracy of our uh, alignment systems, which is a big W. So um, <laughs> what I will say here is the, uh, the target for the vision accuracy that we wanted to have here is achieved. Let me make uh, this one additional point. Um, have a look at the design of the fiducial. Um, you will see here that this is a circular shaped fiducial in this uh, given example. I will say that using circular fiducials or tilted crosses enables us to do sub pixel uh, fiducial tracking, which 
might be interesting or might be necessary in um, yeah, one or two applications just for the back of your head. Uh, in contrast, uh, we've seen uh, just a beer or um, a straight uh, cross in one of the earlier slides. Therefore, the image uh, or the uh, IR uh, fiducial tracking is limited pretty much um, to the resolution of the pixels that I have available. And this, uh, of course, is system dependent, but this could be in the range of uh, 200 to 300 nanometers. Okay. Christoph, yes. for, my, for my own um, um, benefit, what is a tilted cross? A tilted cross is uh, nothing but a cross fiducial that you tilt a little bit. Uh, say uh, in an angle of uh, 15 to 30 degrees. It's created on a sloping surface on the component or? Uh, not on a sloping surface, no, it's on a flat surface, but uh, with uh, in relation to the, um, uh, to the camera system that we are using, it is tilted. Your angle of vision, angle of view is? Yeah, pretty much. Normal. Okay. Um, th then we are able to make use of our, our make full use of our vision tools and uh, overcome even limitations that we have uh, magnification wise to do uh, fiducial tracking of even sub pixel uh, resolution. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next slide uh, is a little video. Uh, big thanks to Fabian here for pro uh, providing this. Um, this will indicate uh, how we envision it and how we've done in the past. We sink uh, the semiconductor into, uh, into the cavity. And then what comes is an inner changing focusing of uh, the substrate and the uh, semiconductor. Then we are aligning them uh, toward another. In this particular case, uh, the example is we go with uh, yeah, round shaped fiducials. We are co align them co actually until we are in the final position. That uh, position is then uh, best suited uh, in terms of distance and uh, angle to the waveguide. Of course, this is a very generic, uh, very rudimental um, animation. You would want to have, for example, a slight angle to avoid back reflections when it comes to the waveguide, et cetera, et cetera. But this uh, shall just indicate how the alignment is done. That is in uh, alternating uh, Z planes to do the, um, the alignment in X and Y, and then ultimately uh, we're doing the touchdown. One thing um, that I will say here is with respect to doing the touchdown, uh, again, the parts have to allow us uh, to do the, uh, the best possible alignment. One thing that we cannot do, um, aided by the IR vision, is align in Z, so in height direction. This is something that your parts uh, have to provide us. Um, either by means of, or by means of hard stops or um, whatever you could think of in this regard. Um, but what we are able to do is uh, do a proper uh, alignment laterally and rotation wise. Christoph, to what extent is that different from viewing and trying to align from the top? Do you still, when you align from the top, you still also don't have that Z adjustment or do you? You do not. Um, First of all, from the top view, uh, what you will have is you will have a significantly and different uh, sharpness planes uh, from the die that you are aligning towards the uh, um, uh, the mm -hmm. sonics chip. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, you kind of relate that this is uh, diced properly for each and every part. So really what you want to have is you want to uh, see where the waveguide is or where the fiducial right. is and that fiducial being in the same plane that the waveguide is. And I, I guess another way of formulating my question is, do you, if you were to, to view this from the top, uh, try passively with a machine vision system from the top, so not through the silicon, mm. and would you still need the hard stops is my question. In Z you would, yes. Okay, so there's, so effectively there's no, there's no loss, there's no negative um, aspect no, to that. No. The, the in question Z, in the chat we have is from, um, from Ali. Um, I think you touched on this a little bit earlier in the um, in the presentation, but what is the resolution of the infrared camera and the minimum detectable feature size? So the minimal resolution that we can set up right now is in the range of 200 to 300 nanometers per pixel. And uh, ultimately this depends on uh, what the machine design in the end requires magnification wise, uh, but typically in the range of 200 to 300 nanometers, one pixel. Um, the second part, which is a comment, um, usually in wafer bonding, we can detect voids greater than half a millimeter in size. 
Um, so obviously we can detect us, we can detect elements um, and features um, much smaller than that. And I, you, you say two to 300 nanometers, I think is what you said, but you, given the right judicials, you also said earlier that we can do sub-pixel resolution. Exactly. Okay. At least in terms of positioning, not necessarily in terms of recognizing a feature or... Yeah. Um, okay. One add that I uh, that I might make here, perhaps also um, the, the question addresses of how big we are able to detect. Um, so let me say that the field of view that we have is in the range of 400 by 600 uh, micrometers. So what we've animated here, um, you would not see the whole component. Then is that correct? That's correct. In re in reality, you would be you would be looking at one judicial, and you'd maybe go and look at another one in succession. Is that is that how this would work? That's correct. One fiducial at a time. And this is also why I would recommend uh, if you set this up uh, for manufacturing that you uh, design your parts in a way and that the fiducials uh, are um, um, co-aligned to one another so that we would only need two positions basically uh, to uh, set up uh, X, Y and RZ. Understood. OK, thank you. Welcome. Please continue. Next slide. That is combining the two techniques, that is the uh, laser soldering and the IR vision. And on the next slide, uh, you will see that we can do this in multiple ways um, that we have available here at Fikentech that we've already built uh, for uh, machines for our customers and that we have uh, set up here uh, in the R&D for uh, yeah, investigation sakes or to, dim and to demonstrate feasibility, I should say. Um, here are two examples. Um, the one thing that I want to uh, direct your attention to here is uh, that here we have the IR vision and the uh, laser processing decoupled one, uh, from one another. So in one position of the uh, imaging system, if you will, we're doing the vision and the alignment. And in another fixed offset position, we're doing the uh, bonding. So switching between these two positions you know, pretty much depends on the uh, on the tuning of the axis system underneath, but this uh, takes place uh, within one to two seconds, or even less than one second. And um, one even more, um, yeah, interesting approach that we are having a look at here in the R&D, next slide, is uh, combining the two techniques uh, in one uh, beam path. Therefore, uh, we're using one additional beam splitter to encouple the laser uh, radiation and do the uh, laser processing. Uh, but the one thing that we additionally need to do so is one switching unit uh, to switch between a, um, a vision lens system, uh, a microscope objective in this case, and uh, the laser focusing lens. Um, but I will say that uh, this is a very compact and um, yeah, fast processing solution that we set up here. Uh, the other thing that I will say is if you want to uh, go in such uh, kind of a direction, uh, you will um, yeah, have to make a little bit of a trade-off between accuracy uh, and processing speed of die level or wafer level, uh, whatever, uh, because you have this additional beam splitter. Of course, uh, this can be uh, tailor-made uh, in terms of transmission uh, from the um, yeah, illumination radiation that we are using, but you will lose uh, intensity uh, when you're doing the imaging. Uh, so therefore you will lose contrast. That makes sense to you. But the good news is uh, we can offer both. And uh, all, not only for uh, investigations here in the R&D, but also when setting up a machine. Next slide. Um, here's just the uh, comparison of uh, the, the two uh, systems right next to each other. Um, these are, yeah, pretty much interchangeable in our uh, setups is, is the point here. And uh, next slide is already the summary at the end of my talk. Yeah, the best suitable uh, system, as you will see here, uh, for laser soldering is um, this has to be ch uh, chosen with respect to the application that you have in mind. Um, saying this, uh, this depends on uh, features like how thick is your wafer that you want to bond to. If you have very thin wafers, uh, you uh, rather want to go to the uh, more commercial or more standard uh, laser soldering approach with the around one micron technology. If it's real thick, it makes sense to uh, think about the 1475 nanometer uh, wavelength. The IR imaging, um, this stands and falls with the uh, chip and wafer quality. It must be polished among some other uh, things like dopant lever or something um, that I didn't um, address in this talk, but we will, uh, we will need the opportunity to do proper imaging. 
If that is available, we can um, determine positions and do uh, the alignment in the end with an accuracy of maybe as good as plus minus uh, 300 nanometers, I will say at this stage. And uh, I will also say that uh, we have different combinations of the two techniques available here. So uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, please free, uh, feel free to send me your thoughts and I will uh, demonstrate feasibility to uh, do joining with um, yeah, very high, if not sub-micron accuracy. Christoph, thank you. Um, we have some more questions or at least one in the chat. I encourage everybody else to, to line up their questions if they have anything they want to ask, just please type it into the chat. Um, the question we have from uh, um, Javier, I hope I have pronounced that correctly. Can you comment on the time needed to align with submicron resolution through silicon? So our, we have our animation. Our animation is obviously a, a purposely slow process with, so that we can illustrate it. Um, what, are your, what, what is realistically possible in, in, your, in your setup? Uh, depends on the imaging quality and uh, also on the programming skills. Me here in the R&D, I gotta be honest, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that uh, sophisticated of a programmer, but I can imagine this taking place uh, in, in a second uh, time frame. Do we have any other questions in the chat? Did I leave anybody's question asked? I think there was somebody who suggested, here we have another question from Jörg Smolensky, compared to, compared to classical soldering, when would you right. make the choice between laser assisted soldering and classical soldering for silicon photonics dyes? Um, me being a laser guy for uh, bonding, <laughs> I would always choose uh, laser over uh, oven soldering, for example. Um, because of limited process time and um, efficiency uh, in the first place. Okay, we have a question from um, Wen Jing. What limits the alignment accuracy? I think we've covered that already. Can you briefly go through again? What limits the alignment accuracy? Uh, the alignment accuracy is limited uh, by the um, vision quality. So uh, the, the higher quality um, contrast uh, the vision is, the higher the accuracy um, we can achieve here. And uh, as I put it down on this very slide, it could be uh, as good as plus minus uh, 300 nanometers. That's what I'm seeing right now. This is also, of course, a subject to change, but this depends on um, the polishing grade, the doping level, uh, the fiducial design, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we, it's, this is gonna go on for a while. We have some more questions rolling in. From Brian Kelly from Eblana, hello, hello Brian. For laser soldering, one, what is the typical laser spot size or what area of solder is exposed and melted at a time? That's one question. Would you like to answer that now? Yeah, um, so typically we're setting up our uh, laser process to have a spot size of um, or between 200 and 600 uh, microns in diameter. Uh, okay. Then again, it depends on the regime uh, that we have available. So if we're choosing uh, this uh, heat conduction uh, laser soldering or the direct impinging, uh, impinging through silicon soldering, um, then, uh, or in the later case, um, the uh, area of reflow is equivalent pretty much uh, to the beam diameter or the beam size. Therefore, you could also think of uh, DOEs to form the beam in the way that you want to have it. And uh, on the other hand, if you are relying on the um, heat conduction regime, um, this could be as big as um, one or two uh, millimeters square. Okay, so I'll continue with the rest of his questions, but I think these have already been answered. Number two, is the spot raster scanned across a solder pad? I think the answer to that is obviously no. It's a, it's a one-shot event. Um, is that correct? Yes. Right, and then number three, um, in a two, or I guess the real question is in a multi-pad device, presumably one pad is soldered before the other. Can this lead to large stresses in the chip? Um, another answer to that before Christoph answers is, when you could also split the beam and do uh, multiple pads at the same time. But Christoph, please, you're, you are probably the best person to answer that question. Okay, uh, I wish I could do so uh, to, to do some sort of an electron beam uh, approach here. Um, but um, yeah, the answer is yes. If you, uh, if you go 1475 nanometer uh, laser beam, you would have to process uh, one pad at a time or say two to three pads at a time. Also depending on the, uh, on the uh, chip and die that you have available. If you can impinge uh, on a wider area, that's not damaging uh, anything of the die, for example. 
And uh, then you would uh, have to rely on uh, processing designers, I would put it, um, to process pads in a way that uh, shrinkage, distortion, of course, all a very low level, does not inhibit your accuracy at the end. Okay, uh, we have a question from Ali Musavi. Um, what are the analytics and predictive soldering performance? In this question, he is talking about active control of soldering process for zero defects. That's an excellent question. We're not monitoring the, uh, the soldering process itself at this given time. Um, what we are doing is uh, we are looking at what we soldered with the IR vision after the soldering process. So we can uh, get a feeling for the degree of reflow that we uh, were able to achieve. Okay, but there is right. no uh, such thing as active monitoring um, at, this given, at this given stage. I, there was a slide earlier on where you showed us a mosaic, um, or was it even a QR code pattern um, of 200 micron solder reflow spots, right? So I, and, and, I mean, those were all generated sequentially without any process control for zero defect, or at least no process monitoring, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, Kevin, perhaps you can quickly um, scroll back to that one slide just for whilst I go through, thank you indeed, whilst I go through the other questions here. Um, back to Wen Jing, his original question was, what limits the alignment accuracy? And then based on your answer, he then asks, what is then the placement tolerance? So we can see a traditional, we can do the uh, traditional alignment to, to 60, 70 nanometers, you say, when we actually let the chip go, is it then on target? Okay, I will have to think about that. So yeah, obviously the uh, the objective is uh, that there is no such thing as postponed shift. Um, if this is the direction the the question is uh, pointing at, so um, we are and we are aligning, doing the touchdown, and uh, then the uh, the position is pretty much set in, pretty much set in stone. Um, we hold the die. Uh, we do the uh, laser soldering uh, with the uh, pre-evaluated parameter, and there, uh, then there is, uh, then there can occur such uh, thing as bonding or postpone shift. But if you do it properly, there isn't. Okay, let me see. From Alexandra Vyasov, we have the setup for through silicon um, soldering. Could we show it once more? So Kevin, could you please scroll up to um, the slides um, right at the start? These are slides number uh, These eight and nine, I think. Right, exactly. They show the schematic for um, through silicon soldering. Um, there's also slide number 10, which shows a comparison between um, um, heat conduction and directly hitting with the laser beam. Um, hopefully, Alexandra, that serves your purposes. Otherwise, as I think it has been mentioned already, um, this webinar will be available on our website in a few days once we've done the edits and posted it up for the on demand. Um, Maureen, hello again, welcome back. Shh, Maureen missed the first part of the talk. The question is, are there strict rules on the judicials? Alignment marks to use. Yes, um, um, we have discussed that already. Um, uh, Christoph can get, it, get directly back to you, but if you watch the webinar per view on demand in a few days, you should find out um, what it is you need to hear. Ali Musavi, um, my suggestion would be to get in contact with us. You can drop me an email or drop Christoph an email directly or Moritz, um, um, and we can discuss what your requirements are. Um, and from Alexander, one more question. Was the beam homogenized or is it scanning? Um, neither nor, I believe, right? Um, it's not scanning. Uh, we do have one uh, optic system available that's uh, pretty much homogenizing the beam, or I should say okay. that's homogenizing the, uh, uh, the temperature fields, uh, going in a some, somewhat like a donut mode, okay? Okay. But this was specifically designed for uh, some customer part. Okay, so um, let's call it a day with the questions. And thank you very much. That's been one of our most interesting question and answer sessions in the webinar so far. Uh, we've always had a very good attendance today. 
Exactly right, Kevin. If you can go down to the to the roundoff, Christoph. Thank you indeed for your contribution and for answering all the very the very many questions. Um, quick roundup. Um, as Arazi has already been mentioned, um, we will do an edit on this, and this will be posted on our webpage, and it will be freely available per view on demand. If you missed anything, um, you can either view that, or please feel free to drop us a line, get in touch, and we'll try and answer any questions and address any requests that you have. Um, if you are in other locations around the world, obviously you can get directly in contact with those locations. Here they are listed. Um, and I think if we move on to the next slide, that is an overall thank you. Thank you to Kevin um, for being the technical lead and helping us with, uh, with um, play this webinar, play the slides to you backwards and forwards and being very patient. Thank you to Fabian for the animation contribution, which I think was also presented at Peak International, and we will be posting this online in a more comprehensive format in the near future. Thank you to everybody who attended. Thank you to Moritz in the chat for answering a couple of questions, our head of R&D. This was a very successful webinar. Thank you again to everybody. And with that, we will sign off and say goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>